Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to, before we start, just would like to introduce uh, a few words, a short by an introduction to my very good friend, a person whom I respect and love very much, Mr. Better to say Dr. Garnet Dupuy. So Mr. Garnet Dupuy is an integrated healthcare specialist with decades of international experience in multiple methodologies. He is the inventor of technologies and devices, which he designs, by the way, by himself, his focus remains the amalgamation of techniques and technologies that are biophilic in nature, meaning techniques and technologies that love life because they're based on living systems. His work is founded on a model that considers consciousness as the foundation of health and well being and is based on understanding the consciousness as the primary unifying aspect of methods that bridge the divide between techniques and technology. Garnet is a very interesting person to have conversation with, whose knowledge and mentality extends beyond the mainstream agenda and mindset. We have met first time at the conference in South California, where both of us happen to be speakers. And uh, on one of the evenings on the dinner, during dinner, Garnet told his fascinating stories about rescue in Gibbons. So from that moment, I knew that there is much more unusual mm. and extraordinary in his personality. Over time, Garnet introduced me to some of his projects that he has been working on. And man, I gotta tell you, some of that stuff just blew my mind away. So without further ado and without wasting time, a very good afternoon. Garnet, how are you doing there? Uh, just uh, tell where you are also. <laughs> where I'm, um, I'm here, I'm home. And uh, thanks for all the, uh, the nice things. We'll. Uh, uh, we'll have a lot of fun today. I'm sitting in my office. It's a home office. Uh, I live up in the mountain rainforest in northern Thailand, about a, about an hour east of Chiang Mai. So um, I'm in a beautiful place. And, uh, you know, I've... Um, I've this been is, to your place, is, you know, it's one of yeah, those yeah. magical places, you know. Well, uh, just, uh, if, uh, just to put all that um, sort of... Uh, uh, just to be honest, you know, absolutely honest. Well, I gotta tell you, man, this is uh, your home is one of those places where you can get a, a, a very deep physical and spiritual recharge. You well, know, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the, 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 the serenity, agree. the serenity, and uh, uh, you know, the vibes of the place, and it is so <laughs> organic. You feel so great that the place has got natural ventilation. You know. Yeah. What more do you need to say? You know, uh, for me, that, 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 that's it, you know, that, that's it. So it's really well, it's a place that you feel there. Listen, um, for all of you that might be listening to this or listening to a recording, uh, Dimitri contacted me a few days ago and he said, hey, why don't we do this thing? And I said, what thing? He says, well, let's get together and talk. And uh, I said, well, what do you want to talk about? And he said, well, let's just... I'm paraphrasing. Let's just talk and kind of see what happens. And I said, well, that's either awesome or really stupid. Uh, <laughs> I, ha I, I, love, I love the idea of uh, the spontaneity. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I also honor the fact that if anybody's listening, um, unless you just want to spend time, uh, it's a, uh, to me, learning is sacred that's mm -hmm. that's the main that's the main thing and if there's any amount of learning that uh, you and i can share and that other people can share in the midst of this um then uh i'm pleased and happy to do it so uh, let's see you know i have things that i'm interested in and so do you um and this I, is I gotta... so deep and profound you know garden this, this is just you you know because uh, uh you may look at our conversation as you wish, you know, at any uh, point of view or any angle, but you have that, you, you never stop amusing me and amazing me, you know, with <laughs> your vision and with, with okay. the way how you actually approach to things, you know, and how you treat things and people and everything that you do, you know, and, and yourself also, you know, so okay. it's really, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. Okay, listen, listen, I got a yeah. word. Let, let's yeah. start with this word, because, uh, uh, you know, Dimitri and I were chit-chatting a little bit, a minute or two before we started recording. And um, uh, 
something came up and I won't refer to it, but I responded, I said, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from the famed anthropologist, Margaret Mead, who's no longer with us. And uh, she was an extraordinary person. Uh, Cross-cultural learning, you know, is where you bump into a lot of things that are not from your own uh, mindset. And she had said at one point, she said, when something was presented to her, she said, you know, this is the kind of proof that I wouldn't believe even if it was true. And um, that to me sets the stage because there are a lot of questions that you really can't answer honestly or maybe not clearly uh -huh. because the question itself is inherently flawed. So here's the word. The word is, let's talk a little bit about axiom. Eh? An okay. axiom. Okay. okay. Uh, for people that don't know, um, simply put, because, you know, Dimitri and I have a, a lot of easy, good vibes and connection. And at the same time, we have, you know, our own personal perspectives and points of view. You know, I'm a, he's from, if you, he'll explain where he's from and his training. He's got more letters after his name than in his name, right? Oh, oh so, uh, right. So he's got this whole thing happening, right? Scientific, academic thing. And I'm a, you know, pig shit shoveling farm boy from Canada. Uh, who's had uh, an interesting learning journey over time. You know, lots of schools here and there, but this word axiom. An axiom is a self-evident truth mm -hmm. that requires no proof. Mm -hmm. An axiom, right? It's just yeah. the way things are. It's reality. Yes. To me, if you don't have some pause to look at what is axiomatic to you. What you think is just so goddamn obvious. There's no even, there's no reason to even consider thinking about it. Well, I, I believe in experience a lot. You know, okay. I believe in experience. Tell me so about as, it. Long as, uh, as long as there's something that uh, I've experienced myself uh, and yeah. uh, that would be it, I would not require any more proof. For me, that one single case uh, quite often is sufficient. Okay. But you said, to, you said to me when we were chit-chatting that before a certain presentation, a person did some kind of thing with a crystal. You didn't know what it was yes, called. Yeah. Maybe it's Reiki. And yeah. you said, you know, I don't know if it was placebo. Yeah. But I felt really good. And I said, why yes. do you think, why is your first thought that it's a placebo? Well, again, that's uh, partially my personality because... Uh, uh, I, I'm trying to be at least, so I consider myself to be a savvy person. So in other words, I'm trying to, uh, not to say like criticize, but to be skeptical yeah. to things, almost yeah. to everything. Yeah. And unless I, I really well experienced that. So why I said that, I don't know, was that a placebo effect or something else? Yeah. Because yeah. I did not study the actual effect. And, and I did mention to you that... Um, mm -hmm. Well, it is good enough to have one personal experience, but uh, it ends there. I can't make any more conclusions. I cannot apply that to anyone else. I cannot transfer mm -hmm. that as a knowledge or practice because simply I, A, do not understand how it works, and B, I was not trained to do that. So yeah. uh, for me, having a, like, put it this way, a, a scientific uh, mind, you know, and looking at everything from this point of view, I like, all right, why did it happen? Well, I give it 20% or 25% to the placebo effect. Uh, mm -hmm. By me saying that, I actually mean that, well, there's probably 85% of that probability that it's the actual uh, electromagnetic field, you know, some kind of uh, uh, action behind that, which mm -hmm. I actually, uh, in principle, are more inclined to believe in simply because I i um, convinced that there is much more to what we do not know rather than to what we know and understand. So in terms of the um, magnetic, electromagnetic fields and whatever other types of the energy yeah. fields in all, there's tremendously more. We're living only in the fourth uh, or fifth dimension. Which one is there? You know? <laughs> I mean, well, it depends. One, two, we, we, we keep on moving. Yeah, we keep, we keep on yeah. moving. You know, in between. But, you know, look, okay, the, see, here, here is one of the things I was, I am looking forward to. I'm, I'm enjoying right now about uh, what I thought about having this time with you. Is I think okay, 
but we're both smart people. Okay, you know, meaning intelligent, which is, which is a good thing. And that, well, yeah, yeah, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and then the other is that uh, we're both interested in very similar things. Uh, let's call it, you know, helping or healing and learning mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, there. And um, your training, you know, you're trained, I think, originally as a surgeon. Um, yep. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, I, I spent a lot of years uh, doing body work, which is, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, it's like you're right there with the same body, but uh, you're doing a different thing. Different that, tools um, only. Yeah, but you know that. You know, maybe it's it's reasonably safe to say that we have we converge at the same point, but from different perspectives. Because you have a very strict, traditional, advanced medical training, from surgeries all the way up into regenerative medicine, uh, and these are highly technical. Uh, and I have my whole collection of things that have their own technicality, and yet we we converge. Um, how how we can be together at the same point when having different perspectives to me that's really intriguing that's very intriguing because right now these two things have to go together you know this idea that oh conventional medicine is bad and holistic medicine is good this is a very stupid attitude you know and yet the language is quite different sometimes the attitudes and the vibes are quite different and yet everybody's trying to get to the same point, which is to help to heal and, uh, and be good and be yeah. good. You know, so part of this is what I'm interested in. One of the things I'm interested in uh, with you is how you would interpret things that I do and how I would interpret things that you do and end up at the same point because we need each other. Yeah. You know, believe me, if I have a car accident, don't take me to a homeopath. Yeah. Right. Take me to a surgeon, please, yeah. Yeah. as fast as you can. Yeah, so. it's very, very, very good that you asked me this question because uh, I did not ask that myself. But when while listening to you, I sort of instantly uh, had an answer. Go ahead. Uh, and it's a very honest answer. It's a very first thing that just popped in uh, in my mind, popped up in my mind, and uh, yeah. simply because over the years of my learning and practice and experience and my personal mm -hmm. experience as a human being, I came yeah. to conclusion that the approaches and the methodology that you use in doing essentially or targeting the same are simply superior to what I was learned, what I was learning really? and what I was taught over the years. Yeah. Wow. I've, uh, I, I, I tell that to everyone that six years ago, uh, while working for a conventional uh, medical uh, healthcare system, being employed by the government and all, and working the surgical work, you know, it's all surgical department and what I was trained to do. But uh, I came to conclusion, I call it, I hit the bunker wall. I came to, yeah, I came to the point that I saw tremendous limitations of all those endeavors that conventional medicine is trying to do. Tremendous li limitations mm -hmm. in terms of uh, managing a specific individual health or life, as well as managing the entire civilization. It, it, it was so limited uh there were so many unsatisfactory results there were so many failures and uh, uh there were so many delusional attempts uh, which by the way if you read a scientific literature about the longevity or the anti-aging put it this way science plus medicine you know those big publications they have the biologists, yeah, yeah. geneticists, uh, and the clinical doctors all together so uh what they conclude is that uh, when you try to Treat and even if you look at it from a mathematical point of view, mm -hmm. um, even that uh, the the concept uh, what well, I'll come up with that later, you know that the curve, you know that the chances for you to die increase exponentially with your age, and it also mm -hmm. depends on the uh, uh, external and internal factors, you know. So uh, that understanding or that me witnessing that, not to say failure, but just the limitation of uh, that uh, mm -hmm. system, conventional system, plus being a very adventurous person. 
uh, a curious guy, you know, put it this way, and quite adventurous in terms of, uh, I do allow my mind just to go free. You know, when I read certain books, I, from those books, which uh, some people would just consider, well, that's either too much or the sci-fi or it's unproven or it's some kind of a far out science, you know, I just always say, why not? You know, it, it may work, you know, and even you, you look at it this way. Uh, could you tell somebody, say, 150 or 200 years ago that you can bring a person into the room that will have two some metal plates and you can put a hand or the body in between two metal plates. And then in the next room, there will be a film coming out with a picture of the bones and all inside. Well, if sure, you tell sure, sure. somebody to 300 years ago, people would love it. If you would tell, say, 60, 70 years ago to anyone that you can puncture a vein and put a catheter inside, put under the x-ray, and you can cannulate the carotid artery, and you can inject dye, you can put the stent, the cardiologist would have told you that, uh, well, well, you're a murderer, you know, what are you doing? You know, people are going to yeah, die. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's so many things that happen by mistake, you know, and then the, 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 the first person who okay. has done that. I got a, I've got a question for you along this yes. line. Um, can you give an example of one f form of, I don't know, let's call it healing, I don't even know, treatment, healing, that you've encountered that has really impressed you and is more or less really outside of your conventional training? Like some kind of, what the weirdest shit that you've come across that has actually impressed you? Wow. Uh... I gotta tell by a weird shit. You, uh, this I, is provocative yeah. question, Ghana. This is yeah, a yeah, okay. Question. You know, I've I've had a lot of different opportunities and to work with different groups and companies. And I've worked with this one uh, neurological group that used to do uh, uh, implantable spinal cord stimulators, and they got involved in a new company working with Russian methodologies and technologies. Okay, uh, some of you know what that is. And um, so they brought me in. I was a consultant. Uh, they wanted me to work. I, I'm not going to move there. I wanted to live in, in the West Coast. And I said, okay, I'll be a consultant. So they said, well, what do we, I don't say, what do you want? The, the business card. They put medical affairs consultant. They didn't know what to put. But internally, in the, in the operation, my, uh, my affectionate, I hope, title was weird shit consultant. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I used the word weird shit in a very affectionate and positive way. What weird shit have you encountered outside of your conventional training that has really impressed you that you want to learn more maybe you want to use it tell me about your weird weird shit consulting uh experience yeah well uh, as i said very provocative question yeah uh i got few things i okay. i don't even know i definitely uh what i and that's what i wanted to talk about is the neurovisor you know and what i've experienced okay all right cool. okay so okay. uh we, we we're gonna talk about it you know whether we're gonna talk about it now or later okay okay all right it's, we got it's, time. it's it's yeah it's one of the things that uh is on the list um hyperbaric oxygenation and okay, cool. uh, and uh, temperature alternation when I was 15 years old, mm -hmm. uh, I, I started going to gym at the age of 13 years old. Okay, okay. and uh, without uh, properly realizing the reason why I went to gym, you know, and why now I, I know in later over years I understood that I just wanted to do the biohacking. I was always fascinated with trying to change your modulate <laughs> we to, your we've got to we've got we've got to talk about this biohacking thing too put that on the yeah. list yeah. after yeah. neurovisor okay go ahead so um when i was in that gym you know there was a bunch of enthusiasts you know all the guys who are doing the heavy weight lifting bodybuilding all that stuff yeah, yeah. and there was also a group of guys who were very much into the holistic wealth health uh, health wellness and stuff like that you know so they had where in the uh, world where the, where in the world were you some people don't know where you're from that, that was in uh eastern ukraine that was in a quite a small town where my grandma used to live when she was alive and that was like since early 1990s okay that's when cool. 1991 cool. 92 that's when it was happening so uh those guys uh, there was a big group you know for the whole families and they were bringing kids you know and then like two or three generations of uh, the followers and all uh, they would have certain health practices. Well, apart from being uh, very uh, 
strict with with diet. You know, the, a lot of them are vegetarians. You know, and not taking mm -hmm. meat at least and stuff like that. And uh, healthcare, wellness, bodybuilding, lifting, and all that stuff. But they had uh, sessions when they were. Uh, jumping into the ice cold water you know when it's in the yeah. winter or autumn you know and, and eastern ukraine especially those days it was freaking cold you know <laughs> so you, cold, you yeah. can do you, yeah. you can do that like at least half of the year or maybe seven eight months you know in a year you can yeah. easily dip yourself in a very cold water and uh, that was like done every week and then uh, it was uh, mm -hmm. usually alternated with a sauna high temperature and, and stuff like that i gotta tell you that i felt fantastic Okay, this you felt fantastic. This, yeah, I, you I did felt that. fantastic. You, you, did, yeah. you did that stuff. I, right. I was in the group. Yeah, I was in a group. I wasn't there for right. like for many, many years, but I was at least a couple of years in that group. Okay. And uh, you I, put this in the category of weird shit, or because some people think this is normal well, yeah. for certain cultures. I mean, well, now look at it this way. Wim Hof, you know, is, is a wonderful person, you know, really an uh, inspiring character, you know, and, and yeah. for so yeah. many people. And uh, uh, the things that he's doing in a nutshell, you know, in, in my humble opinion, if you just break it down. So uh, it's like uh, uh, he's uh, exposing the body to extremely low temperature with a vasoconstriction and all that, the ROS, everything launched, all that, the cascade of response. Sure, sure, and in the sure. same time, you regulate your respiration, your oxygen supply, oxygen yeah. transport, yeah, yeah, yeah. and also you have, you, you continue continuously pumping in the oxygen into your uh, central nervous system. You may be mm -hmm. producing more nitric oxide. After that, you will open your periphery, you will have better perfusion, better blood supply mm -hmm. and all. You know, so literally I was doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing that. The difference between me and other, put it this way, enthusiasts is that uh, most of the people, those who are uh, yeah, involved in biohacking or something, they would do or follow one methodology or just one principle or do something, one thing. I love to experiment with things and I like to understand how it works medically. So for me, yeah. it's no longer what I do, but it's more like, okay, what am I planning or targeting to achieve? So, and uh, being a doctor and a scientist, I look at yeah. my body and then any human body as sure. I look on the um, metabolic biochemical terrain. So literally, I look at it as a transformation of molecules and to from one chemical reaction, to biochemical reaction to another, you need the catalyst and stuff like that. So uh, that's how I see uh, okay. you know, organism so at all. Based, yeah. Okay, based on this, I asked you about weird yep. shit. Uh, to me, that's not weird shit. It's like, that's just good, sh good shit. Pardon okay. me for swearing. Okay. If... Implants weird right shit, then. but I'm not into implants. <laughs> weird shit, yeah, that, that I can see. We have, a, we have a, an amazing long list of possible topics, I can tell you. Anyway, so I got to ask you right now, you're a doctor, you're a big deal doctor. Uh, and I mean that in a positive way. I mean, you have a lot of experience, you're expanding in ranges of learning that are really exciting to me. Thank you, nice to hear Here, okay, I'm going to say, on behalf of all of us watching, if there was only one thing only one thing that you would have a person add to their life to make their health and well-being better supported. What's that one thing? Uh, I, I'm, I have a sufficient amount of evidence. I believe that I have a sufficient amount of evidence. Come on, I'll believe you to, anyway. Come on, what to, is it? To, to consider that uh, 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 in this case, when, when you said that one particular thing, uh, yeah, there is one particular uh, treatment or biohacking or the procedure, which I believe every uh, living homo sapiens supposed to do. And uh, that uh, comes from the domain of uh, ethnopharmacology and uh, uh, ethnical medical system. So uh, specifically, uh -huh. I'm talking about the ayahuasca ceremony. I think uh, that and wow. probably wow. the 5 MEO. I uh, put it this way. Wow. Mm, I think that it is unfair for homo wow. sapiens, for a person to live and not experience <laughs> and, uh, that at least once yeah, in a lifetime. Well, you just jump that, that's, the, that's, that's serious, the deep end know? of the that's the deep end of the swimming pool. That's a uh, that uh, for for some people that's that's pretty weird shit. 
for yeah, some well people. yeah but that, that's uh, that's bringing back home yeah that brings you back home you know that that's the whole idea and it's just the medicine and then well come on when we we all understand how it works you know we have the uh mao inhibitors as, as uh, uh drugs which are used for uh, uh in psychiatry psychotic conditions you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. here you have uh, the same molecule uh, which is just uh, procured from the uh, plant which uh, acts as the monoamine oxidase inhibitor thus uh, mm -hmm. empowering another molecule which is uh, nothing else but a uh, one-step chemical reaction from the melatonin and uh, uh, that's, that's it you know okay cut out all the technical talk if we're in a simple term uh, why why why, why did you choose that one? I don't think you studied that in surgery. No, no, no. I studied it. It's my own, as a part of my uh, enthusiasm. You know, I was reading and, and following this thing for like for many mm -hmm. years, decades and all. Well, uh, because, because I believe in uh, psychosomatic uh, uh, domain. I believe in psychosomatic relationship between the central nervous system and the body because uh, uh, for the past couple of hundred million years the most rapidly evolving part uh, of our anatomy was brain and uh, we have to take that into okay consideration. we're going to talk yeah. about brain some more after, after yeah. you say something let's talk about brain yeah but keep going i mean you know i got to tell you i didn't expect you would choose this one as the single thing that would be most beneficial to most people um i'm totally intrigued uh, I'm not without my own opinions and experience. Uh, uh, it fascinates me that you would, uh, I guess, you know, go out on a limb uh, and, as a medical professional and propose uh, something like this. That's well, it that's started. In that, that, that there are publications, there are studies, yeah. um, which, which yeah. are done in the mainstream universities, and I, I'm reading that stuff. You know, I'm not reading yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, with all respect. I can't even speak the language that the shamans are speaking. You know, uh, yeah. my data is based on the publications in the peer-reviewed journals and the articles. You know, which uh, describe yeah. the yeah. pharmacological aspect of that. You know, but uh, the psychosomatic is is extremely extremely important because. Uh, as I live longer myself, I understand that the, the mindset and uh, the mood through a short term and uh, your uh, mm -hmm. more long term fluctuations, you know, like the clinical yeah, yeah, depression yeah. and stuff like that has yeah, been yeah. tremendously underrated. Uh, about 15% of a global population have a clinical depression. People say, well, it's predicted that by 2030, it's going to be a second cause of death. Uh, after mm -hmm. cardiovascular, look at what's happening with the lockdown and COVID-19. I believe it's going to be faster. Yeah. You know, it's not the yeah, COVID-19 yeah, yeah. which is going to kill us all. You know, it's going to have depression. So, you know, and, yes. most, most folks don't know much about what I do. Uh, my profile, I've always been kind of a low profile guy. But uh, this domain, the domain of, and I meant, you mentioned it in the, the introduction, the domain of uh, consciousness of mind um, is my primary reference. That's my mm -hmm. starting mm -hmm. point. And we don't need to go into why that is, but that's my starting point. And, uh, uh, and you know, to me, to me, okay, you mentioned ayahuasca. Uh, that's that's an agent, and then there's the action that it, mm -hmm. it provokes. I'm mostly interested in the action side, and very cognizant that there can be different agents involved. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you order something, do you don't really care whether FedEx brings it to the door or DHL brings it to the door? Those well, are the those are the agents. Yeah, you know, the fact yeah, is, is that you, you get you get what you ordered. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I've uh, I've spent my life. Uh, I'm a little older than you. Obviously, I'm seventy. Uh, the um, on the timeline, uh, uh, psychedelics were a very important aspect of my life. And then uh, on the timeline, I began to practice classical, what we'll call spiritual traditions. I'm not saying good or bad about anything, just that's the way. So right now, I am most intrigued by the, the consciousness aspect of all of, all of this. You know, here, um, you, uh, I have to, I have this actually it's a bedside book because I've been reading it again. I don't know if if I show this, can you read it or does it show up backwards? 
Oh, mescal and the mechanisms of hallucinations. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's written. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Th this, this, uh, wow. there are two, two articles here that were first published in the late 1930s. This is uh, Heinrich Kluver, who is a famed professor at the University of Chicago. And uh, if you ever do uh, an internet search on Kluver's form constants, K-L-U-V-E-R, Kluver, mm -hmm. Kluver's mm -hmm. form constants. Uh, this, uh, you know, Dimitri mentioned for you, those of you listening, this, uh, this device called the Neurovisor. It's something, yes, that I'm developing. I've invented and I'm working with the team. He's experienced it. Um, there's, um, there's so much involved with, um, I don't know, call it, I'm not sure whether to call it the mind or the brain. I'm not sure. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's an artificial, uh, division. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether, well, okay, you jump right on ayahuasca, so I can jump on, on this thing a little bit too, that, yeah. um, that, uh, um kind of there are two things right there, there are two things i don't know let's choose one i'll call it what's the brain okay i think that uh like i said the axiom right i i think that we we jump forward without looking too closely at things sometimes like brain you think brain right away you, a picture comes in your mind of this you know thing I don't like a wall in that shape or, yeah, okay uh, this is my my very short thing is i think that there are minimally four overlapping brains absolutely and i think if you look at the phylogenetics you know the evolutionary development mm -hmm. which is pretty much mirrored in the ontogenetics you know the development mm -hmm. of a human being from yes. you know yes. from insemination to to the whole embryology yep. yeah blah, 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 right that i think the first brain and I also talk about this other stuff called first language. <laughs> it's like, you know. It's all on the list. You know, I, I came okay, here prepared. I, know, I, know. I came prepared here. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> you know. So anyway, what's the first brain phylogenetically? I think the first brain is the membrane. And in the mm. developed organism, we call that the skin. All right. The skin, the skin is the first brain. Because what, what's a brain? I mean, don't use the word. What's its role? Kind of what? Coordinate and regulate, right? It yeah. coordinates and regulates so the brain got, decides what goes inside the cell and comes out well, of the cell. yeah you know i, it, I got even, the point yeah. right so it's this controlling regulating organ yep right and yes, right phylogenetically when you have just a simple single cell uh, you know it's like that's the brain it, it coordinates and regulates exchanges you know it mm -hmm. starts to create this thing called the internal terrain and the environment which is another yes. false concept you know, it's a stupid concept. Absolutely, uh, we can't se we can't separate environment from Absolutely. our inside. Dumb idea. Okay, what's now the organism gets a little bit more complicated. So now it has to kind of start moving things around inside. So the second brain evolves forward. We call it the gut. This is the thing comes up. Minutes yeah. upgraded. Host includes. I just said okay. There we go. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So what's the second brain? The second brain is the gut, because the membrane has been taking care of things at a simple level, but now it's getting more complicated inside. So you have to have transport. Yes. Right. And, yeah. and organization and regulation is more complicated now. Now, because you've got a gut doesn't mean you, you no longer have a skin. You don't abandon, you integrate the brains. So mm -hmm. skin and gut, first brain, second brain becomes a holistic brain. Mm -hmm. Now, the transport's becoming even more complicated where you got to move a lot of things around all the time at a higher complex level. The third brain is the heart. That's the third brain. And then as it keeps going, you can see probably where I'm pointing, the, the cranial brain, the central nervous system is the fourth brain. It's the four, you know, because the, the brain grows from the spinal cord up. It doesn't grow from the, from the head down. So yeah. over time, over now to me, these four brains constitute the entire regulation and organization of the system. So, you know, uh, all this thing of, oh, how much of the, the neurotransmitters from the gut affect the brain, and how many messages well, come from the heart. Well, at least we have all that brain. stuff admitted now by the conventional science, you know, and uh, yeah. the claims which uh, say 100, 150 years old, 
death looms in the intestine or your gut is your brain even they say you know like a gut feeling yeah. and stuff like that well i look at it uh, uh, you know because of the, the serotonin you know and stuff and yeah, the, the yeah. hormonal neuro hormonal refla- uh, relationship you know why you have yeah. that gut feeling and or cramps or stuff like that well, you've got so much serotonin in the gut whether it goes to the brain we don't know so the point being for example just and, and of course we a- yeah we, we'll add in uh, absorption and uh, uh, resorption and of course we have to support uh, more larger amount of bacterial cells which reside in our body than the total well, amount of cells in our you body. Know, we've got three so different we genetic to, yeah, domains, right? Correct. DNA, mitochondria. Mitochondria bio. and the bacteria, yeah. yeah and yeah. we have to so, communicate with all of that. So I agree. I might not agree on the heart, you know, so it's not that important. You know, just a mecha- as you said, it's just a messenger. Yeah, yeah that's you a know, delivery system. Yeah, yeah. Delivery this, system. You know, the, you got to give up the idea that the heart is a pump. You got to give that oh, up. Okay. So you're okay. talking about the whole metabolism. Uh, this is the idea that, you know, medicine tends to be reductionistic. It tends to be mm-hmm. anatomical. Mm-hmm. It looks for mechanisms. That's a dumbass axiom, in my opinion, right? <laughs> that's a dumbass axiom, right? So, because okay look at okay again ontogenetics right the development of the embryo at the earliest stage look at the area that where the heart will be located anatomically do you notice that there is a beat before the organ happens it doesn't the heart does not have a beat the beat has a heart Mm -hmm. well yeah because anatomically there's a system which is uh, uh, but no you can just see the fluid pulsing Concentration, like dispersion, yeah. concentration, yeah. dispersion. That place develops the tissue to become the heart organ. So to play because the game. Because the principle goes first. The idea, yes. the principle function. goes first. The function goes function. first. Yes. How do you it's think that, you know. It's the field that will make the electron spin yeah. in the right or left. Correct. It's not right. an electron. It's just that the, the object uh, is uh, intrinsically is inert. It needs the principle, the, function, the field that will the function. The, the, the function drives the structure. Absolutely right. You, yeah. you don't have, you, you know, phylogenetically, an eye doesn't evolve and then say, hey, this is a great idea. Now I can see. No, you, the, have, you have answered the question why I've uh, put the ayahuasca as uh, the most important thing to do okay. for every person. Because why? it directly takes you there. It shows you that it's an upload no, uh, no how download yeah of information yeah, from the outside goes. yeah it yeah, goes yeah, from yeah. outside it just goes straight into your brain you get the function okay you if, you enter that the field okay let's play let's play the, the little equation game here if if we can say that the beat has a heart we could also say that the mind has a brain function leading yeah. to structure yeah because yeah. It, you know there are a lot of folks especially conventionally trained it's it's the majority of materialistic based science that the what we call consciousness is an epiphenomena of a complex neurological process it's like you know i don't by the way that's not my point of view i don't believe that th- they say like the mind is like the foam on the beer yeah neither do i i don't believe in that okay okay so I, I, tell I, me what I, you believe. i'm totally I'm, I'm i believe in consciousness you believe I believe it better because you're using consciousness to believe it. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe in consciousness, and tell me, more. I believe I'm that uh, it uh, it goes beyond that. It goes uh, to the level of that there are specific principles, or as you said, uh, the functions here, yeah, which uh, yeah. uh, actually define everything. So uh, partially, it's also it's our consciousness. So you can say that. Uh, a certain state of consciousness when you reach your whatever a certain state of consciousness mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you will just uh, that will enable you to a better understanding of uh, a larger number of principles on which mm-hmm. uh, the function of the universe as a whole as well as the function of this little mm-hmm. planet and the function of your cells and your body and your life the transition between the moment of when of your conception to the moment of your death what goes after that you know it's all those those all are the parts of the principles which already exist whether we like it or not okay give give me an example 
Give yeah. me an example of one principle that has become evident to you, however it got there, whether it's ayahuasca or a kick in the butt or doing surgery, one principle that has emerged in your experience that is, a, is becoming critically important, is kind of a unifier or a guide for you or an insight, a principle. Because principles unify various uh, activities and experiences. When you see, oh, that's the principle. What's, an, what's a principle that has emerged for you in your experience? Two principles, probably. The principle okay. number one, I would call it, as I understand it for myself, is yeah. the principle what life is. And uh, to understand what life is, uh, when I start asking myself how, that oh. through that question, I sort of came closer to understanding the principle of what life is in, in, in principle. So uh, this how, what I have figured out for myself is that uh, perhaps the intrinsic mechanism, which will uh, sort of a driver towards a self complexity and self replication, uh, that principle, which maybe uh, was an incidental or accidental, or maybe it was a pre-planned function, I don't know. But there is a number one principle that uh, based on that, everything exists. Based on that, the very first living being, that small strand of DNA or RNA in the uh, phospholipid bubble, which somehow mm -hmm. that combination of molecules, which probably was like, what, 20 delton or something, maybe some 20 amino acids or 20 uh, these uh, <laughs> RNA sequences, somehow yeah. they just build themselves in such particular structure that they have empowered themselves to self-replicate or complicate itself to create. Now, do you think that was, that was just a, an accident, the famous random I'm not mutation sure. I, Darwinian I, I, I stuff? Unlikely, it's because just, uh, no, I'm an was, idealist. It, I'm is not life an realist. accident? What, is no, life an accident? I don't think so. No, no. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, but some scientists, those, as you said, the materialistic scientists, they would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, that uh, could be by accident. And probably you can even prove that with uh, some mathematical theory. I don't know. I, I'm not a mathematician, but there should sure, be some sure, mathematical sure. theory that capable it's, it's of highly, It's that. highly unlikely. It's famous, the, 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 the chimpanzee banging on a typewriter to write the great novel, right? <laughs> it's, I, you can't I have say a, it's impossible, but it's highly improbable, right? I have a painting in my home, which uh, I paid as a donation to the sanctuary of uh, orangutans, which was uh, drawn by the orangutan. Yeah, yeah. It was painted by yeah, yeah. We, we have We have something to talk about. Um, you know, yeah, so I don't know. forget, yeah, <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, topic is extremely important. So yeah, so okay, look okay. at it this way. Why I think that is very important because uh, I'm looking. I don't. At, I don't understand it. Yeah, but I don't understand the principle that you're saying. The Listen, principle uh, is. Have, yeah, yeah. I have a look at this. I, I have a. a uh, it's a kind of an interesting game that I play, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. usually with friends that are willing to tolerate it. Um, I want you to express that principle in ten words or less. Uh, the intrinsic principle of self-complicating intrinsic, intrinsic principle, principle of uh, I'm counting self-complicating its own structure. Okay, but the, you know, I got to say that reminds me of a pretty standard view of what constitutes a living organism is uh, procreation, self-replication. It just sounds to me like. Yeah. Well, but I uh, not only for that. I think that's important. If you would just extrapolate that, to, <laughs> I can be. I can be a dickhead about things. this. You, you know, right? Right. I can extrapolate it to some minor things which are not that profound or uh, do not have the evolutional meaning and stuff like that. Just look at uh, businesses or just look at your life or your career. Uh, yeah, yeah. The general tendency that sort of like a driver is from becoming small to growing and from becoming quite uh, less complicated becoming more complicated mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and are we doing that based on any rational uh, argument uh, what pushes us to do that there, there is then 
gene of uh, adventurism that has been constantly pushing you ahead. And it's a great thing, you know, that's why we evolved, you know, so the whole evolution and the whole life, it's uh, sort of, it gives uh, guidance on what you're supposed to do in your daily life and your daily activity if you take it really seriously if if you claim that okay well it's a simple thing i don't understand it you know it's everyone is talking about it well if you don't understand it practice it practice okay. it all the time I, what what of one of my, this one of my favorite topics is complex adaptive systems right mm -hmm. adaptive responses right and you'd mentioned in some fashion this before the 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 way that systems seek to thrive but must prioritize survive right if you don't survive no. you'll never thrive uh those uh i look at it as the pleiotropies uh that comes okay. along that comes okay. along that's a function number two so that's that's a secondary thing the primary thing is just make yourself complicated complicated mm-hmm I don't know. It's my humble opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, I'm thinking about it because um, complica complicated mostly sounds bad to most people. It's like, ah, oh, it's complicated. You mean complex? You complex, mean yeah, lot, complex. A lot, right, a lot, of, a lot of choices, yes. right? A lot of Develop. ways. Constant of... develop, structural development. It's, it's going mm. somewhere via multiple roots, you know, it's developing. Yeah, but, so, you know, so I think the dancing partner of complexity is simplicity. You know where it, uh, if it's got to be simple enough that you can maintain complexity without it becoming complicated, right? Okay. So okay. Okay. What, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. If it, uh, Ackman's razor, you know, the simplest one is, you know, probably the one, because we can't. So what's the? But tell we me know something. that it's not so. We we know that it's not so simply because of the singularity. Got it. Okay, you, you have okay. to admit that. It's, I simplicity, you... it, it just doesn't even stand as an argument. Okay, that's just okay. a nice thing for a chat, but we are uh... moving towards singularity. That's here is a thing. Now, this, the principle of singularity, frightens me. I've been thinking of that, you know, and in those uh, moments <laughs> of deep psychoanalysis, you know, I try to perceive that. Yeah. On a spiritual level, I can't. What do, what, what, that, pe people you... don't know what you mean by singularity, perhaps. What do you mean by singularity? Well, what I mean to I singularity I, is that, yeah, would you explain that? English is your, well, I know that you can speak French, yeah. but English is your yeah. first language. You know, it's my second or okay. third language anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you go ahead. Okay. Singularity. Um, Touche. I, I was, but there's something you have to, you have to define first. Yep. And then, then I'll define singularity At to the best way. Okay. Please, def what do you mean by the word simple? What's, what does simple mean? Yeah. What's simple? Well, yeah, uh, um, it's relative. You have a relative yeah. called simple? Uh, no, it's, uh, how, it's, <laughs> is it relative or relative? relative. No, I'm joking. I, I, yeah. I'm just screwing with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Related, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, uh, I, I understand, yeah, what, what you mean. Yeah, there is, there is no such thing as uh, uh, define something complex enough or to be qualified as complicated or something which is less complex to be qualified as simple. Yeah, you're right. But it's I'm, I'm talking about the trend. You know, the trend okay, is I, always in... in yeah, okay, okay. I, I have... Uh, structural uh, complexity, put it this way. I, I, have, a, I have a saying mm -hmm. that comes honestly out of my experience, the depth of experience, however deep that may or may not be, that simple things done well work well. Simple things done well work well. And oftentimes people will abandon simple things because they think they're not working. They become more complex with what they're doing, but it's only because they're not doing the simple things well. And with a simple thing, there's no place to run, no place to hide, it's naked. You're, it's simple. You're either doing it well or you're not. Like, do you get enough sleep? That's simple. If you get enough, you know, simple things done well, work well. well. You know, if we look at it from a biological and medical point of view, so yeah. not enough sleep is definitely not that simple. Okay, there's okay. so many factors which are involved in that. Um, by the way, 
Do you it's drink enough water? Do you drink enough water? I, I know that I personally don't drink enough, as much as I should have been drinking. That's another big point. Okay, to forget the line of thought. I've been waiting to ask you this question because of your experience yeah. in healthcare, medicine. Mm -hmm. Why is it, this is, I'll make a generalization. Why is it, do you think that we, and I'll say we meaning humans, mm -hmm. we, even when we know certain things are good for us, we know it, mm -hmm. but we don't do them. But we don't do them. What is that? What is that? There's many reasons for that. Uh, but have you noticed it? First of all, okay. my blood give you, Yeah. Is oh, it? no, no. Absolutely right. I give you a classical example, a, okay. in my opinion, a very absolutely classical example to what okay. you have just said. So uh, before I continue, let us define what are the inclusion criteria to become a classical example of this. So in my opinion, <laughs> in my opinion. Oh, shit. <laughs> okay, go ahead. In my opinion, uh, as long as uh, there is no obvious uh, biological reason or any rational reason for doing that, but the person is still doing that. So sugar fructose sugar any sugar for the matter of fact it does it is not involved in a single biochemical process in our body yet we consume that and the reason why we consume that is very simple our taste buds our, our receptors yeah. in the tongue in the oral cavity they uh, are capable of uh, feeling that sweet taste and our yeah. brain does not have any association of that taste with any potentially poisonous substance ontogenetically and phylogenetically, okay? okay? Simply because on the planet Earth, in nature, there is no substance which is poisonous uh, to the human or to whatever mammal, except yeah, yeah. sugar, except sugar. But we do not see those damages immediately. Those damages are stretched over years and decades. And uh, although we have been educated, our prefrontal cortex, not our amygdala, mm -hmm. because we educate our prefrontal cortex telling that, you know what? You are consuming the actual addictive substance. You know the definition of a drug? You know the definition of being a drug addict? The person who consumes carbohydrate is a classical drug addict but <laughs> it is not it's just the knowledge that you receive in the first generation in your okay. amygdala it's not imprinted as the hazard as a as a jeopardy as a threat it's not okay. that's okay. the reason and you have no benefit for that no biological benefit absolutely okay okay good enough okay. Uh, that's the op that's not the answer that's like the opposite to the answer my my question it's interesting i'll give you that my question is because that's the bad shit why is it that there are things that you and i and everybody else around us we know that they're good for us we know it mm -hmm. we've even had proof yeah. yet we don't do them but we don't do them why why because there's an alternative in, in this the, case with the sugar there's an alternative and the alternative is so uh addictive put it this okay, way okay, it's so okay. pleasant well, it's so pleasant you trade in uh, you trade in I, i've seen all your your alpha exercise stuff uh, exercise is a good thing right you and on top of that very in, in a number of cases for you to do something that is good for you requires yeah. an effort so that's the reason mm, so that, as long that, as again as long as uh, you are not your central nervous system is not wired in such way that it will make you enable you to overcome in the inhibitory uh, reactions in your brain and sort of like pushing yourself and showing well i maybe have a will so you know, are you saying that it, that it's hard to be good well Everything is a process. <laughs> Everything requires action. You you gotta put some ATP molecules to, to do something, you know. Anyway. Yeah, but if you enjoy it, it's it's much easier if you enjoy it. Some people enjoy exercise. Some people oh, yeah. hate exercise. Yeah. Yeah. 
right? And it depends right. what sort of exercise. I have my favorite exercises, and I have exercises which I okay, hate. okay, okay. What what exercise form do you know is good for you? It's beneficial. It'll make you feel better and perform better. You know it, but you don't do it. And why don't you do it? Come on, uh, Tai Chi, Tai Chi, and Karate. Tai Chi because, and Karate. Yes, because I've been doing that for years. And if you follow the Kata or the, the specific forms in the Tai Chi, which and then the Karate yeah. ultimately took that from the Tai Chi yeah. in, uh, through the Okinawa in 16th century, you know. So uh, the Karate came to Japan only in the beginning of 20th century. So uh, uh, it, it was <laughs> Tai Chi. Actually. So full of information. <laughs> so why don't the point is why don't you do it? And if it be, I, because I've tried it, I was doing that in the past, and uh, I, I know the benefits, tremendous benefits for the body, for the musculoskeletal apparatus, bones, joints, everything, development of all the groups of muscles proportionately, but requires uh, persistence. That's why they say it's door, it's a path. That's how they call it in Japan. Or so it, it's what, you, you don't have the, you're, 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 you're just, yeah. you don't want to, why, why don't you want to do it? Because you don't want to, what, it takes too much effort? Uh, because I find alternatives again. Because I trade in just for the dumbbells uh, uh, at home or the high uh -huh. intensity uh -huh. training, uh -huh. because uh, I can do that more free, more randomly. Uh, I don't have to follow a structure or a specific form. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, I, well, I feel like today this is better or that is better. I do just that. You know, I give myself uh -huh. more liberties. Uh, okay. And, you know, the trading, human psychology in there, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, throughout my life, uh, for certain reasons, I was oftentimes asked, a particular question in many forms, but this is the basic question to follow our talk. They'd say, what's the best kind of exercise? I said, that's easy. They say, really? I said, yeah, it's easy. The best kind of exercise for you is the kind you're going to do. Yeah. The one that's that the best one. Yeah. The, yeah. The, not, not even that it works for you. That, that's the one that you'll actually do. That's Agreed. the one you'll actually do. To a certain extent, do. yeah. Yeah. What do you mean to a certain extent? If you don't do it, it doesn't it doesn't matter how good it is for anybody. If you don't do it, you got to well, do it. You got to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, because it's debatable to a certain extent, uh, you can say, well, some form or some particular method or some technique is uh, more beneficial in this or that condition. Of course, there are variables applied to this. However, uh, there's a, a bunch of uh, guys who are uh, walking evidence when in the age of 70, 80, 90 years old, they yeah, still yeah. retain their flexibility and then boost their health and all. And when you ask them, so what are you doing? He said, well, I'm not doing anything much. It's uh, the same squats like every 20 minutes uh, yeah. a day. And I was doing that yeah, yeah. since I'm 16. But yeah. yes, I do it. So, yeah, it's yes and yes. And yes. Works, yeah, and, and yes, yeah, it <laughs> works, works different ways, works different okay. ways. For different people, it works differently. By the way, by the way, before mm -hmm. I forget, and that was a question that I really wanted to ask you, and uh, slowly I would like to move into the direction of the, your project and your work, because it really okay. fascinates me. Okay. So the question that I would like to start with, um, and then further on, I will, I'm expecting you to give more details about the neurovisor and all. In your opinion and in your observation, yeah. do all yeah. people react differently on the methodology and the technique that you are developing and that you have designed? Do you see any differences in terms of gender, age, ethnicity, or maybe the IQ level or spirituality or something? Or you can say that pretty much on a fundamental level, we are wired unanimous in, in, in the unanimous way, universal way. And uh, these techniques that I'm applying or these methods of uh, entry through the sensorial uh, yeah. apparatus of the central of the body of the organism yeah. are pretty much standard for mammals or for primates, including human yeah, and non-human yeah, yeah. primates in a way. Okay, yeah. uh, a, a little um, context. Uh, I've been developing uh, a device called the NeuroVisor. It uses highly structured light and sound to induce or promote uh, activities in the brain for people that don't have any idea what the hell we're talking about. So yeah, you put it in your head and there's light and sound. Uh, so 
Well, the... one second, one second, got it. Guys, you, yeah, yeah. you have to understand. So you have the headphones, similar to the headphones that Garnet is wearing now. Yeah. And you have a specific, uh, like a screen, you know, it's like a VR, like a virtual reality kind of a stuff. It really looks that sci-fi. But you got to close your eyes because right. the uh, message in the form of the light and the geometrical shapes will be sent, uh, which is sent, is so powerful that you have to uh, absorb that uh, sort of influence through the uh, your, your closed eyes, you know, through the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then it will further project to your retina, and then uh, uh, it yeah. will project to your brain. It will stimulate different areas of your brain, same as music does, you know, and the beauty of this is that it's absolutely synchronized, yeah. And uh, uh, I would say one minute, 30 seconds throughout the program that I've tried, mm -hmm. uh, you sort of, uh, you, you have an intrinsic understanding. It's like a signal, a notion that is sent to you that things that are happening now are not random. This oh, is sure. a controlled environment. This yeah, is yeah, a controlled yeah. function. Things are happening for a reason, and you actually feel it. And the sensation of bliss, uh, of uh, mindfulness, that yeah. sort of spirituality, uh, some kind of intuitive understanding of your own self, your own reality, including the roots where you're coming from. And believe it or not, uh, on the 11th minute, uh, uh, sort of a closer realization of where I'm heading to. And uh, here I'm coming to the, my, my second principle uh, that, that uh, you, you, you asked before is, uh, it's yeah. not actually singularity, it's the acceptance of death. It's the mm -hmm. acceptance that even though there is probably a singularity in some dimensions that uh, are beyond my personal existence, but there is a principle that it, it's gonna end. And after it ends, uh, whatever happened before would not matter to anyone, just except me. Because uh, there's nothing that I take away with me after I'm gone, absolutely. And whatever I've done is just mine for me, and it's no one else's business, as well as other people's life is none of anyone's built business, and it's not my business as well. Mm. So the understanding of the reality, that the reality is now, it's not the projection in the future, it's not some kind of prediction, it's not your expectation. Mm -hmm. It is just a realization that the only reality is now, at least at the level that your brain can perceive. That is a, a, another thing that uh, I, I had that throughout the two experiences with the Neurovisor. Yeah. It was controlled environment program. The very first time when I tried it with the light sensitivity test and all, it I was spooked a bit. Yeah, it like bit freaked me out. You know, for a second yeah. I had a thought. It crossed my mind: Would I be able to go through the entire experience? Sure. To that extent, I, I gave that thought uh, permission to exist. You know, like whoa. Yeah. Will I be able to take it? And then uh, as I just relax and I just let myself into the experience and after we have done the test and we started the actual program, do you remember there was a moment when, and we were observing another person doing that before, and there was a moment sure. when he just laughed and when I was doing that, I just laughed there. And then you explained how it actually works. What, and I, I witnessed that first, that sort of reaction, the transition. About well, one minute, 15 or one minute, 30, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's sort of because you were imbalanced and then you have literally a fall into some kind of, uh, 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 you know, abyss, into the abyss, but it, it's a sh very short fall. And here you are on the ground, you're on the foundation, you feel yourself absolutely great and solid and you're just happy with that. You just feel the <laughs> sensation of joy. And that's why everyone laughs people just giggle like whoa it's like uh, uh, you're on the, the health scale that you know the the, the uh, how do you call that roller coaster a roller coaster sorry the roller coaster stuff 
Yeah. You know, it's like, whoa, but you're safe. And, and you're, you're just taking over and carry it throughout the, the experience. And that's what I want to understand, Ghanit. Please explain <laughs> more uh, how it works, what it works. Uh, 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 I mean, how, how you came to this. But most importantly, is it a universal effect? Or okay. yeah, that was, it's, I, it's I knew there was miracle. a question in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, it's universal in capacity, categorical in reaction, but very individualistic in its meaning. All right, lucky I'm recording this. <laughs> yeah, the, um, for example, because, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, I have a YouTube channel, it's called Neuro, Rea Neuro with an O, Neuro Reality NR, mm -hmm. Neuro Reality NR. And if you put the quotes on either side, it'll target. There's some videos there where I, I explain some of this stuff more. And I think, you know, Dimitri has had, you know, we've there had conversations. Link, there would be a link to this in the description to this video. Okay, cool. I'm gonna That's put very nice. There, yeah. Okay, super. Thanks. Uh, and uh, there's also a, a website, a formative website called NeuroVisor. It's a weird spelling, V-I-Z-R, Visor. Mm -hmm. it, you just sound it out, NeuroVisor.com. So anyway, um, I, this has been a long um, journey for me. Uh, I began working with these early technologies when I was in university in the late 60s. Uh, and uh, if anybody has any, any understanding of what that time was like, um, uh, it was a time of exploration, experimentation, and a lot of liberal interpretation of things. So I began working with light and sound because my what drives me the most is, I don't know what you want, consciousness, spirituality, I don't know. That, that stuff motivates me, it always has, and it was motivating me then. From then until now, I've been trying to appreciate the principles underlying it, and I end up uh, with what I call first language, first language. Uh, the first language was that something that you have discovered for yourself, or there was something that uh, somebody indicated you throughout your research. You know, we're always influenced by our teachers and traditions. Uh, it that that term in the principle seems to be something that I've understood within my experience. But I can't separate my experience from everything else. But you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I made you know I I can say I made it up. You know, uh, I was trying to find a way of appreciating it, the it right, and the it is that. Well, okay, William James, if you know who he was, uh, he was the he's called the the father of American psychology. He was he's just brilliant. Uh, turn of the nineteen hundreds, so late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. Um, and he has a principle that he called homeomorphism, homeo, same, morphism, shaping, that all living creatures, having evolved on Earth in the same set of atmospheric conditions and temperatures and nutrients and minerals and so on, that there must have been, at the very start, some way of interrelating slash intercommunicating between organisms. And, and I believe that. Uh, and this is what I call first language. First language to me is a combination of two, like a yin and yang. Mm -hmm. They come together to make first language. One is electromagnetic radiation, mm -hmm. and the other is mechanical vibration. It's what we call light and sound. All right. All right, and it's universal right. throughout the species and even the plant and kingdom and everything. Anything living uses these two in some way. Yeah. So it's what I call first language. Uh, and first language is fundamental. It must be simple to be shared at a complex level. Mm -hmm. You build on simplicity into complexity. Mm -hmm. you, always, you can't start complex, you start simple and then you fractal, right? The fractal self same replication. So first language is light and sound. And by the way, there's a second and a third language. 
the second language is movement. All and right. the, third the third language is cognition. OK. Are Those you familiar the with languages. the theory of the morphogenetic field? The Rupert yeah, very, very, yeah, 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 it, very much. Does so. it does it overlap in a certain some way? Yeah, I, I think the the morphogenetic field uh, is the the matrix or the context that allows the languages to develop. Mm -hmm. a, 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 what is a language? A language is a mean of communicating information. All right, right. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I think there are templates. There are morphogenetic fields. There, are, you know, all all of this but in and of themselves, they're potentiated, but they're not actualized. What brings them from potential into actuality, that's this radiation and vibration, radiation, vibration. So um, what I've done is my very best to understand the principle of knowing without thinking, knowing mm -hmm. without thinking, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. thinking is, is third language. Yeah, have you noticed yes. right right yeah. well i won't use the word consciousness because we we have to define we even cognition cognition yeah it, it's ideation you know the idea of formative thoughts ideas uh it's it's a basis for the language we're using right now would you put right? a chemical reaction as a part of it or as, as a well yeah the, 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 again those are agents and mechanisms but they're not the okay. endpoint actions right all right all so right. okay the the best example of first language in mammals, and we'll say specifically humans right now, because yeah. you know I, I live with apes, so I have a whole opinion about that, mm -hmm. right? Um, that music, if you want to know how the brain talks to itself, just look at music. Music, music is brain talk. Mm -hmm. Because all it is, it's, it's, you know, tones and pitches and vibrations and pauses and silence, right? There's, you know, I always give the same, maybe it's a stupid example, but if I had a really sad experience and if I had the ability to compose music and I'm not very good, but let's say I did, and I composed this song, no lyrics, no words, just instrumentals to express my grief. And then it's played to you and I say, Dimitri, listen to this. Yeah. I don't give it a title. There are no lyrics. Listen to this. Tell me what your experience is. Within a short period of time, you start to feel the grief, the remorse, the sadness. Those things are absolutely tra transferable, uh, and we, we feel that throughout all the cultures. And all it's like the mood, you yeah. know. And, and you uh, identify that, um, and you categorize that instantly. Yeah. You you don't even yeah. think of that. Yeah. So okay, it, so well, it, it's a mystery what's behind that. So I, I believe that you are well, you open it up. Well, it's yeah. uh, it's. Okay, let's say it's a mystery. The, now, why music? And in the neurovisor, there's light and sound. Light. L think of it at a practical level. Throughout humankind's history, whatever that is, I'm not arguing about Atlantis or anything like that, but throughout human history, it's been easy to manipulate sound. It's been easy to work with mechanical vibration. My voice, ah, uh, the original mm -hmm. instrument. Mm -hmm. I can pound percussion, then strings and blowing yeah, yeah it's been much much easier to express first language with mechanical vibration mm -hmm. what did we have how could we manipulate light we had sunlight moonlight firelight maybe a spark some phosphor a firefly only recently only very recently with our technology that we're beginning to be able to manipulate light in a manner as complex as we can manipulate sound. Yeah. Light, for the humans, for us now, like right now, you know, believe me, I think I'm looking at you on this screen. That's not you. That's, that's a manipulation of electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. Whoa, right. yes. whoa. You know, the, the, the biggest mind-blowing example of first language mixing with third language is the stuff we call movies. Dude, there's no dinosaur up there on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's a mental fabrication. You can even go deeper than that. If uh, I'm not mistaken, whatever color you perceive in reality, yeah. it is the reflected color. So it means that that particular object is 
in reality is any color but except the color that you see okay well that's, that that's re reflected yeah. that's reflected light okay here here's a little short step 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 okay um this goes back to hans berger uh in the the 20s uh he was a, a physician i think a psychiatrist actually was in world war one and he had an experience that he thought was telepathic communication from his i think a sister after the war, he says, I've got to understand this thing. So he started to study the brain. And he's the first one that discovered, technically, that the brain is emitting electromagnetic frequencies. And he measured them. Wow. What year was this? 1928, I believe. Now, he, he was hiding in his lab in the basement doing this research at night because he was trying to find the mechanism for, tele for telepathy mind-to-mind -mind communication. He failed, but in the meanwhile, he it's found out, the Whoa, yeah, yeah, like the first one, yeah. right, right. And it happened to be 10 Hertz, which we call alpha, right? Why okay. do you call it alpha? Because it's the first letter in the Greek alphabet. It's like no special meaning, right? Yeah. Okay, so the brain emits frequencies. That's the first step, whoa. And the second step was to realize that those frequencies had an association with certain mental states. Whoa, you know, oh, that frequency and that mental state have at least an association. We can't say causative, but they associate. The third step was, hey, we can induce frequencies, the yes. famous frequency following response. Hey, wow, the, by the way, that was with, with light and sound. It's electromag electricity, light, sound, right? Yes. You can do that. Now, you also find out that if you measure a person in a brain state, you see those frequencies. It's like, oh, wait a minute here. Frequencies come out. We can induce frequencies. Frequencies are related to states. States can reproduce the frequencies. That, I mean, there's a huge, I mean, this is a huge amount of research was done on this, like in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. You know, people think it's like, oh, this is all brand new or something. No, it's awesome. That's why, you know, the, this thing, that's from the, it's reprinted in the 60s, it's from 1938, right? And this is another one, the famous, if you have the living brain, Walters, right? This yeah. is, um, if you know, William Burroughs and Brian Geisen, The Dream Machine, uh, they, they use this book from the 1950s. That it's like, wait a minute, certain frequencies and certain brain, or we could say mind states, they're associated. Hmm. And we can induce the frequencies, we can measure the mind states, and certain frequencies, with your eyes closed, like you, right, they will tend to produce certain colors, very reliably. Very, it's, it's the rainbow, dude. Mm -hmm. Low frequencies start in, in the, the murky dark reds, and up you go, all the way the rainbow until you go past the, uh, the, ult the, the, the violet and the ultra. Then you get this thing called the flicker fusion rate where it just turns white. That's gamma, mm -hmm. right? So certain frequencies and certain colors and certain frequencies, certain geometrics. It's predictable. That's why I can compose these things. If you wanna see emerald green with spirals, I can code that into the device and that's what you're going to experience, which means you can work to induce certain mind states. And it makes total sense why certain colors evoke certain emotions, why certain mandalas and geometrics have a certain, what's called bi-directionality technically. It's bi-directional. Is this it receiving is dependent? Language. Is it somehow that's what I said receiving earlier. Okay, go back to a simple example. I, I said, you know, uh, the universally potential, uh, categorically likely and individually person, uh, song, even, okay, on a certain day, you'd put on a certain tune, music. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, you know, Jimi Hendrix, right? And you're just like, ah, oh, man, this is just great, right? You love it. Somebody walks in the room and says, God damn, I hate that noise. Why? Okay. It's the same song. Well, why does somebody love it and somebody hate it? Even the next day, you turn on your, your sound system and you're not in the mood for Jimi Hendrix. Right, right. You, you loved it before. 
So what we see is that there's an adaptive quality to this, that the meaning is not cognitive. The meaning is, is more, is deeper than that. Mm -hmm. You know, that what you get and what you know is dependent on all kinds of things. However, there are, there is a tendency, like there's a, an awesome study that came out of Berkeley this is past year that studied music and uh, worldwide cross-cultural. I mean, everything is the weirdest Chinese music, weird to us, to very conventional Western music. And the outcome was that there are basically 13 different reactions to music. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, 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 you exist within those ranges. So first language is not rigid. First language is adaptive, yet it still carries like, you know, a marching band pretty much. And can you see how inseparable the second language is from the first language? Dude, we call it dancing. Mm-hmm. Body we call it yeah. We call it dancing. Why do you, why do we dance? Why what is what is that? One of the most powerful things I ever because saw. Because we want to synchronize ourselves through the rhythm and the physical or movement repetition of that rhythm. We sort of seeking for that uh, synchronicity with uh, uh, with what we hear. That it's again, not, yeah. if we are ready to accept it, if it's sort of in line with. Uh, our uh, state uh, on, on that particular moment. Yeah, because you just maybe not in the mood, you know. Well, you know, dance like nobody's looking, right? One of the most powerful things I ever saw many years ago was a documentary. There's this guy and uh, he developed a, I guess you call it a therapy. Mm -hmm. And what he would do, and then he would encourage and help other people do it, is to dance your life story. There's no music. Right now, through second language, meaning movement, express your life experience. Start chronologic. When you're young, what, what, was, what did you feel like? And then, then something happened and then this, oh no, and oh, but oh, wow. You know, that's why uh, modern dance is so powerful because we allow a liberation. It's also why you know, the, the, the Bacchanal, you know, the, the Mardi Gras, where yes. you just kind of go, go wild, as compared to traditional folk dances that are very unified and very traditional, and everybody does the same thing, and it reinforces the group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then somebody breaks into the center and just starts to jump all over the place. Uh, ecstasis, right? Ecstasy. Yes. Ex yeah, ecstatic. Right. So, that, state, yeah. so that's second language. First language is where I do my work. That's with light and sound. Brain talk, knowing without thinking. That's, that's the, the goal. And it is possible to compose because we can go through, we talk about methodology. We know certain brain states are associated with certain frequencies and certain colors are associated with the frequencies and geometrics of the frequencies so that it's possible hey musicians do it all the time yes they do it all the time now and the sound element that i use is actually not pure music it's uh, it's called mood framing because the brain is a pattern recognition machine i mean that's putting it crudely it always seeks signal in the noise yes. yep. right so I, I'm very careful how I use noise and how I use signal. It's like when you have a good, how do you write a good movie? How do you script a good movie, right? That, that there has to be uh, attention. There has to be a little bit of, of demand, right? And you, you also want to discover, you want to be surprised. If you know the whole thing, it's like, you know, a, yeah, it's a, a boring, formula obviously. movie. You know, I mean, like in five minutes, it's just like, you know exactly what's going to happen. Who, who cares, right? Anyway, so, I mean, there's a very large topic, uh, you know. Thanks well, for that's a dopamine, idea. that's a dopamine system because uh, we uh, sort of uh, addicted to the something unexpected. Uh, that, that's well, one. I don't know if that's uh, addictive or that's motivation. Uh, well, you I know, mean, principally, the same in principle, you know, it's just a dopamine yeah. system. Okay, you know, uh, one, one thing that we talked about the ayahuasca earlier is that there are, in this case, Neurovisor is one of them, brain talk, right? First yes. language, yeah. the stuff. There are two other domains where, and there are actually like 
about 12 domains, but in, in terms of our discussion, attractive domains, because you can have, uh, you know, high levels of stress, you can have starvation, and, and, you know, a lot of these same phenomena occur. But, you know, in that case, you realize, hmm, those are naughty agents. But uh, psychotropic psychedelics are famous, according to their class, of the types of colors and geometrics and disassociations uh, that they occur and produce. And another one, and, and frankly, this is one of the categories that I'm working in right now with the Neurovisor, is I'm creating a whole new set of uh, experiences, compositions, I call them, that are focused. How many do you have by now? How many programs? Uh, last time that we've done that, a few months ago, I think you had oh, the, the, seven or eight. It, oh, the, yeah, I don't know. In the main, the main category, I think I've got, I don't even know right now, 20, something like that. And uh, there's another group that I'm working on right now for the VA, for Veterans Administration, uh, to, to look at that. And the other one uh, is uh, I'm working to create compositions to facilitate the expanded female orgasm. And part of, part of what excited me about that, other than the obvious, uh, is that uh, there are, you know, substantial reports now, because it's quite a an appreciative academic field of study now. You know, female sexuality, even female anatomy was so you far behind Have you tried that on number. male individuals? Not yet. Uh, it's, a, it's a different, so it's, it's a different, um, it's a different terrain. The geography is different uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of similarities. But my point being that uh, women that have the capacity to have the expanded orgasm expanded not extended in time although it may be temporal expanded is more spatial meaning they have many degrees and layers of subjective okay. experience other than the obvious you know physical pelvic floor uh, experience contraction yeah oh, no. uh, yeah and, and the very same i could i don't have it with me right now i've written an article i think i might have sent it to you yeah, you read you, you, you did, read a, you did yeah you read a description of what this particular woman experiences visually mm -hmm. it's the same thing that you experience with the neurovisor it's the same category of experiences with psychedelics that so that in that case you need to uh, download the actual pattern so you you need to get the pattern first right so that you can reprogram or do the reverse engineering of the code for that pattern for yeah. that to be uh, applied on the individual to instigate the same pattern again. Yeah, yeah, this is called bidirectionality. So that uh, if, a, if a person is experiencing through light and sound, the, the typical artifacts of the experience, the expression, the subjectivity of the experience, then the organism gets the hint, it's guided. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a kind of exercise or instruction so that it's, it's an enabling, because listen, you, you know, uh, orgasms may seem to be, you know, from the genitals radiating outward, all of them occur in the brain. Yeah, absolutely. It's in the brain. Of course. I mean, we, you know, we, we, we interpret it to be anatomically here and here and there, but it's a brain, you know, it's a brain gasm. Yeah. So uh, working into the process in brain language and first language potentiates it creates a prob what I call a probability state. You can't make it happen, mm -hmm. but you can create heightened probability by allowing the person to experience these kinds of domains. It's the same thing. I mean, anybody that's, uh, admittedly, it's been a long while, but I, I did my fair share of psychedelics, you know, back when. And, um, uh, you, you know, I mean, okay, uh, just about anything, whether it's, you know, biting into a ripe peach or, or making great love, sex, when uh, you're that wide open uh, is, um, you know, it, it just opens your mind to, to a lot of things. So with the Neurovisor, uh, this is a methodology. It's, a, it's what I call biophilic technology. It's working in a way that the brain, the being, the mind, consciousness, it recognizes it. Like when you see you know, colors that are quote unquote unearthly, like that's the most incredible emerald green. I don't even know what to call it. You know, like that's the way it should be. 
And then when you see the, whether it's hexagonals or checkerboards or, you know, Kluver's form constants, it's like classic. It's just classic. Certain frequencies, certain mind states, certain colors, certain geometries, they all add up because it's a language. It's a yeah. language that is, it's a primitive, you know, and, and this is the thing that William James, I mean, he was so far ahead of his time, 120 years ago, he said that he believed that the central nervous system was innately encoded with an archaic language that was homeomorphic. Well, that was, that was, yeah, that's, that's the reason it. why uh, we uh, give certain preferences to different colors, because uh, we have evolved in such a way that uh, even before we became uh, homo sapiens, we knew that uh, fruits or vegetables of the red color are ripe, and most probably they will not be poisonous. So there is some kind of an association. We have to be tied to some pre-existing knowledge probably or notion of something there has yeah, to be an analogy okay uh, the first it, thing you got to do again it's all information right again yeah, it's information you, you so got the you have one to have of a these point. one of the axioms you got to just like throw away is give up this idea of inside outside oh yeah it's, absolutely give it up. i agree give yeah. it up yeah. give it up you know uh, and and in that way you know like dude Look at the red tie you're wearing. Come on. <laughs> well, yeah, you know? for, for those, I, I would like to explain this for a second for those who <laughs> might not understand what exactly uh, uh, Garnett meant just now when he said that you got to abandon the idea that in principle and uh, distinguishing on into outside and the inside. Yeah. Uh, as simple and as banal and naive uh, or primitive for the matter of fact, it may sound, but um, mm. uh, there is no such thing as I in reality, except uh, only in our perception. And uh, there is no actual uh, boundary sort of between even our physical body and uh, whatever is outside. I'm not even talking about yeah. our consciousness and all. <clears throat> um, the entire existence of the biome, the biosphere of this planet with the evolution and stuff like that. It's nothing else but a transition of uh, specific substances or compounds from one form into another. And uh, uh, for those who might not know this, but every seven to eight years, even our body is completely renewed on the mm -hmm. atom level and on the level of uh, molecules. So yes. are you yourself after seven years or no? Well, that's a big question. Uh, you probably have uh, the same memories and you have upgraded skills. Well, if you've not been wasting time, you know, throughout the seven years, but um, biologically and from the point of view of your chemical composition, you are totally different. But uh, only your habits stay uh, something that you have learned throughout your experiences and all. And there is somehow encoded deep in, inside you. And uh, to this moment, we don't even have a complete understanding. Well, we might think that there's some spacious memory, some habits and all are decoded some way in our uh, cerebellum and all, but who knows? <laughs> and we have some pre-existing stuff in our amygdala also. That's to that extent, we're trying to rationalize and explain these things to ourselves, but because sometimes we're even scared to think that there might be something beyond that, you know, that the whole <laughs> idea. Uh, simple as that. Uh, that that yeah, idea yeah. may actually blow up your mind because uh, if you are not wired uh, to the level of, uh, there's a say, I've been mm -hmm. an atheist, I've been an atheist right mm -hmm. up to the moment when I understood that I'm God. Uh, okay. Yeah, and again, coming back, why I would think that uh, ayahuasca is one of those uh, things that might have been helpful for individuals, because I suspect that you don't have to explain that to the plant. And you don't have to explain to the mushroom. There's just no need to explain to the mushroom or try to superimpose the idea that mushroom mm -hmm. is nature and that mushroom is connected to the, and even structurally, because 40% of the carbon in our biosphere belongs to uh, uh, mushrooms and, and the, the mycelium, yeah. the, the fungi yeah. and the mycelium and all. So uh, they uh, function at that level of 
perfection, literally, you can say that. Mm -hmm. They do not require this to be explained, while the human have lost a lot of its functions throughout its development. So now it has to only rely on the brain uh, to compensate the loss of all those other functions. And we uh, sort of, we even came to that point that we have uh, uh, lost the understanding, the connection with who we are and where we're coming from and where we belong. Uh, we have been absolutely lost in uh, our self-created ideas of ego and uh, whatever the social construct that we have created. You you, know, but, do you know this, yeah. this classic book called Cosmic Serpent? The cosmic well, I, 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 well, I imagine what is it. Well, I did not read the book, but I sort okay. of I, I understand what's All right. the, uh, okay. yeah. I, okay. I even I, um, I imagine I understand why it's called even the serpent. You know. So. Okay. Well, uh, uh, a guy named Narvi, who's an anthropologist, uh, you should read it. Uh, I think it's uh, it's provocative reading for anybody interested. Mm -hmm. um, it involves ayahuasca, but it's not about ayahuasca. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And w w whatever we're talking about, it's not about the Ayahuasca, absolutely. You know, yeah, so yeah, okay. Just but like anyway, understanding, you know, people might think something and all, but no, I mean, this goes beyond that. We're talking about yeah. the idea. Uh, and, to and to synthesize, to me, uh, uh, a premise that he promotes, I happen to believe that it's probably true that um, uh, all living things, all creatures, all things that do this self replication complexity, they have the same. Uh, DNA structure. It's the same principle. This the double helix yeah. is yeah. that's it. If you don't have that, it's not a living being, whether right. it's a f fungi or plant or an eagle or a human. And um, uh, Narby promotes this idea that the that the that these uh, the, the DNA structure is a both transmitting and receiving uh, antenna. Okay. That it. It's involved with uh, electromagnetism at yeah, a basic I, I'm level. I'm familiar with this theory, yeah. yeah. Okay, and that as a summary field that all the DNA on the planet creates a field effect because of the transmission receiving quality of these antenna, that, that this is the basic context of organism communication. Mm -hmm. And in, in this case, uh, the taking of the ayahuasca as, as one agent allows a person to begin to sense the DNA-based communication that comes from the plant. That's why the, all the indigenous people say the plants tell us how, how to use you, it. How did you know that the plants told yeah. us? It, it's, a, right. it's a way of knowing without yes. thinking. It's in the first language, it's the electromagnetic radiation aspect. It's not the mechanical vibration in this case. There is a system to a testing system, like a detector, okay, for uh, reasonability of uh, some particular theory. And uh, one of those detectors actually is uh, government and the CIA and all the organizations similar to CIA and stuff like that. Uh, there's been so many documentaries and talks about the use of uh, various substances like the LSD during 1960s, during the CIA sure. experiments, and also yeah, yeah. the use of uh, repetition, some sound repetition for like uh, a yeah. quarter of a million times in a span of six hours or whatever hours. You can uh, brainwash, tune somebody, and he can talk. Incredible. <laughs> We're going to do one of the podcast interviews with him. <laughs> okay. I'm just screwing around. So, yeah. All right. So, that has been going on. Uh, we, we, we know historically yeah. it's been going on. Even uh, insertion, yeah. uh, well, maybe some people will call it conspiracy theory, but insertion in some images in the video advertisement or the propaganda, sure. it might be used by governments by secret services, or it might be used by corporations to uh, sort of uh, influence yeah. your subconsciousness to make a purchase or something. Um, I know that you've been working on uh, this technology of neuroentrainment and uh, neuroengagement for many years, That's and right. it all started since That's 1960s. Right. To what That's extent right. uh, was there a split in that research group? Were there any, some people who went uh, rogue 
and start working uh, for the good guys or the bad guys, but doing some bad things. And uh, you just went totally into the wellness. So um, what are the limits and what are the other possible applications of the technology that we've been talking about? I don't know, man. I don't go there. Um, I, uh, yeah, you know, fire can cook your food and warm your house or it can burn your house down and kill you. Uh, fire is just fire. So uh, I'm aware of these things. Uh, I, I just don't go there uh, because mm -hmm. I want to focus on, on the, the positive side, the white magic, shall we call it. Um, and, uh, you know, people, you know, if, uh, I, I sometimes say that I, I think that we're too smart for our own good, mm -hmm. meaning we can't differentiate between can and should, you know, because we can make a nuclear bomb. Should we, well, I don't think so, but we do. So, you know, as far as using this stuff for not what we would say not positive, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm totally, yeah, sure, why not? When you why are designing not? a program, I just don't go there. when you I'm design sorry? a program, when you design a specific program, yeah. um, have you ever encountered on a, a specific um, frequency or specific image that you include in the program that uh, does not uh, mm, qualify as uh, a, a good signal. You know, something that you, you tried yeah. this particular signal. Well, it, yeah, it caused sure, some kind sure. of adverse reaction. So you just... Uh, well, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, it's, uh, I think it's fair to frame this kind of work that, that I do. I'm not the only one doing it. Maybe I do it in a certain way. It's a, it's a, a blend of art and science. I think most people realize that there's an awful lot of art in science. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a musician, uh, you know, you're, you're working with incredibly complex mathematical algorithms when you make music and yet people just, some people can play it by ear uh, and mm -hmm. they don't know the theory. So um, when I work, I work as my, my best effort is out of a scientific basis. I work with communication theory and cybernetics and destabilization and entrainment and engagement and neuroplastic techniques. It's all there, right? We could talk about it from that angle. At the very same time, uh, there is an art to it. There's a sensibility to it. Uh, it's like poetry, you know? I mean, it's a, it's a very structured craft and yet uh, it's, it's also highly subjective at the same time. So yeah, there, there are compositions that I make and I, and I experience them, I think, well, that's shit. Uh, and I think, you know, I made mistakes there. Um, uh, and yet there is still that range of subjectivity. You know, I, I, it's, it's like jazz. Um, I'm a West Coast jazz guy, I'm kind of like a ballad thing. I can't do the hard fusion bop, you know. I, I try to like get into Thelonious Monk and Charlie Parker and everything. It's like, you know, dude, I just don't dig it. I just, I'm not that cool. I don't know what the problem is. So. Uh, uh, how yeah. about, uh, let, let's go into Miles Davis, let's go, uh, just, I, I mean, hinted, if well, you're a fan of Miles Davis, okay. started from the Beaches Brew, you know, and all that, the fusion. Well, vibe. Beaches Brew, I mean, that's a whole story. You know, with Miles Davis, you know, the, the, you know uh, some of the folks that, that worked with him, I mean, wow, he was a tough guy. But, you know, uh, one of the things is there was never a wrong note. That was mm -hmm. part of his genius, that he just heard things differently. And you know, that, gave, that gave him an edge, you know, I, you know my, I'm big on Miles. Uh, I, I kind of lean a little bit more towards, you know, like a Chet Baker kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, that, you know, do when I create, well, I call them compositions because they are, we kind of call them experiences or sessions. They're 11 minutes long because that maximizes brain attention. Uh, you know, it's like you can only eat so much food at one time, then you got to digest it. But and, you can go uh, up to 20 over minutes, right? About 27 well, you minutes know, or something I mean, that way. Yeah, you, you can double it up. You know, the, uh, most, uh, all the neurological studies pretty much are standardized in that we can maintain single focus attention for about 10, 12 minutes. Yeah, that's the reason for the TED yeah. talk, 18 minutes maximum. Well, well the that's, yeah. then you can have, yeah, you can have one refresh. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, well, I mean, you know, two times 10 is 20. 
uh, not only TED Talks, because the local neurotransmitter depletion happens after the, the second refresh. For, so mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you start to fade. And, yeah. uh, but that's also why, like the halo device that uh, goes on the head, it's a motor, it, you know, it's a motor cortex destabilizer, 20 minutes. Uh, the V-Light, the transcranial light stimulation out of Canada, uh, 20 minutes. Um, traditional Tia meditation uh, from Maharishi, we're back in, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, classic Shamanta Vipassana training when you're uh, 20 minutes. Why, 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 why? You know, even the uh, classic half hour TV show, take out the commercials, 22 minutes. That uh, that we, we, you know, what I, what I promote is 11 minutes of, the uh, stimulation followed by, if you're wise, about the same amount of time of integration where you just sit with it, eyes closed and you breathe. That uh, I don't want to uh, put training wheels on the brain. I wanna give it a, a, you know, a probability push and then the integration. It's called the hyperplastic state. Right after the stimulation, you're in, for about an hour or two, you're in a hyperplastic state. Uh, meaning uh, 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 a level of increased brain sensitivity to stimulation. So at the end- And the neuroplasticity as well, I believe. Well, I mean, the, the, that's the whole other big, big, big topic. The difference between brain engagement and brain entrainment, uh, the, the neuroplastic responses. That uh, if, you, if you have that 11 minute induction of, uh, of brain exercise, and then you spend about the same amount of time just simple, you know, just being with it or breathing or something, what you do is you begin the integration process so that, because I say sometimes the actual, the actual process begins when the light and sound end. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're eating a meal, you eat yeah. the food, enjoy the taste, the textures, yum, I'm hungry, all of that. However, I mean, you get the analogy, when you finish eating, that's when digestion begins. True, true, true. Well, as much as I understand the actual uh, physiological benefits and uh, uh, biochemical and yeah. spiritual and psychological, but I wouldn't mind doing your advisor just as a recreational uh, sort of, well, well, I like a pleasure hey. device. Well, because, man, it's cool. It's cool. It, it's great. It's the very, sensation is the, fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I say that there, there are basically five general domains that you can use it. Uh, by design. One is wellness, consciousness, creativity, performance, entertainment. Hey, entertainment is not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's a blessed thing, as a matter of fact, in its own way. So, yeah, and then, you know, I'm moving into, the, as I say, like the VA stuff. We'll see how, how that goes. That's more of the, on the rehab side. And then when you're talking about VA, do you mean PTSD? I, I mean, the Veterans Administration, the military hospital. Yes, yeah. so it US. means that it's going to be the patients with PTSD. Well, uh, you know, I'm having a conversation tomorrow, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. But I have an interest there. And those compositions are fundamentally different in design than the ones you experienced. Just okay. in the same way that, uh, that the, the expanded female orgasm compositions have a different structure. Uh, they have a different... Um, set of communications first language is modified for different purposes the ones to what, that you experience to what extent do you think uh, yeah. to, to what extent do you think we we can use this uh, for therapeutic purposes uh slowing down or prevention of neurodegenerative disorders alzheimer's well, yeah, reversal you know, of there, ptsd autism well you know where do we stand here yeah, you know, it's moving in the direction of biophysics, right? We've, yes. uh, our medical systems are primarily biochemical. Biophysics is something we've only used diagnostically, you know, uh, MRIs, PETs, X-rays, all these things. Now we think, well, wait a minute, you know, everybody's knocked out with this MIT study with the mice and the, the 40 hertz, the gamma light sound. And, you know, like one of the peculiarities of Alzheimer's, is, which is, and it's well known, is no matter, I mean, they may not even know who you are or they are or what is happening. And yet they still respond to music. As a matter of fact, if they were musicians, they can still oftentimes sit and play. They can sing along songs, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's because first language is that deeply embedded. That's first language. So even in the advanced degeneration, there's still a profound response and memory and motor skills 
because you'll notice that musicians require first and second language. It's the light and sound, but also movement because instruments require motor coordination. I would like to record the EEG during these uh, sessions. And uh, you know that we have the EEG device. We, we can do it in our setting. Plus, uh, yeah, yeah. are you familiar with Dr. Brigham Balls? Yeah. No, I, I well, maybe, uh, but no. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. A, yeah. Yes, I know, Brigham, I know yeah, I'm about fixing, it. Yep, I'm fixing a meeting with him uh, next week, so we're gonna talk and discuss about it. He, uh, when, when the last time I talked to him and I mentioned on the technology that you've been working in all, yeah. uh, on, uh, he is very interested in uh, trying and doing the actual measurement because uh, he's a neuroscientist as his background and yeah. plus he's yeah, a medical yeah. doctor and he works in, uh, it's from there, by the way, at the yeah. National, uh, Mexico National Institute of uh, Neuroscience, something like that. So they can yeah, yeah, do yeah. all that research, you know, and, and I'm extremely enthusiastic and I'm very interested in uh, what you do. And I, I really want to be a part of it. I want to help you, you know. Tell yeah, us yeah. A, a bit to what extent, what uh, a state of readiness are you in now? Uh, what you might require? What can help you to uh, uh, boost your work and also uh, yeah. If you don't mind, yeah, if you don't mind, but these these gonna well, be published. Okay, everything is uh, is strange right now with the virus, so it means all business is being slowed down. Uh, that's happening to us too. The the stage right now is we have working prototypes, meaning I'm fully enabled to do all of the composing, light and sound. I'm I'm uh, aggressively exploring versions, and uh, we're just now being able to get some prototypes out to parties that we want to uh, engage. Uh, mm -hmm. On a business level, you know, the next step is uh, obviously like a lot of things, adequate funding. And then we go full on into industrial design because what we have right now is functional, uh, but you know, it's not the endpoint design, the aesthetics, the weight balance and so on. But, you know, I've got all of the uh, original, uh, quite demanding software processes, uh, original, you know, composing software, uh, because nobody's done what, what we're doing. So we yeah. had to create a lot yeah. of even original software. So hardware, firmware, software, uh, I'm, I'm all, all guns blazing right now. The next step uh, is uh, the funding that takes us into industrial design. Uh, and um, and then, of course, you know, a marketing structure. You know, the, the, the goal, I won't put a number on it, but the goal is to make this extremely affordable. Yes, yes. Uh, this is not going to be something, you know, for people that have got deep pockets. Uh, it's going to be, you know, right in the groove of, um, of affordability. Uh, so and, less um, than a much less than a latest iPhone, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if, uh, come on, yeah, folks, yeah. if somebody can afford an yeah. iPhone or Note yeah, 10, yeah. 20, whatever, Samsung, come on, this is something that you need. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, you know that you are quite careful and you, you go slow and, uh, and very wise and all. I respect that, although I would have been maybe more daring on my side. I'm talking about the uh, age, at what age that can be used. So you say that for adults only 16 or 18 years and above and stuff like that. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, we have this, um, the ASD and the autism and other pandemic. Yeah. yeah. And uh, those who were autistic kids, uh, now they become uh, young individuals and uh, you know, autistic adults. Uh, so there's a, there's a potential there of usage. Uh, right now, the position has to be simple, uh, meaning, uh, you know, for adults. And uh, if, there, if there are uses for those under 18, then there has to be under a special circumstance. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a company, uh, we, we choose to be conservative, mm -hmm. and, but not close the door if there are uh, appropriate structures. Okay. You know, I, I know there, there are lots of, I mean, in the, there are kids using it uh, in, with very positive outcomes. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, in children, uh, and you know this very well, the uh, neuroplasticity and sensitivity is, is heightened uh, as compared to adults. Yes. So uh, a little bit goes a long way. Uh, one of the 
the, the challenges with this technology is that for a very small percentage of individuals, uh, the, the stimulation can create seizure or seizure-like activities. That's well known. It's been and known that's since- that's mostly the, those who are prone to epilepsy. Yes, that's correct. So, but you know, it's real. I mean, this is also true, not just with this technology. It's been all the old mind machines from the late seventies and the eighties, but it's also true in gaming and VR units. Um, all of yeah. these things have the same caution. So, you know, even uh, in the devices that I have, I have, uh, you may recall, uh, I have a 15 second light sensitivity a test, test yes. a 30 second light yeah. sensitivity test as a way of having some kind of reasonable assessment Mm -hmm. as to the, the probability and you know i say listen if you feel weird stop that's all uh so there is that reality uh it's it's a very minor concern but it still is real so there's nothing unique about our situation this is broadly throughout the whole industry uh even for some people disco balls go to concerts you know with lasers and flashing monster screens and everything like that uh it's like well you can die from dehydration you know if you if you dance yeah. too much you know or from overhydration yeah absolutely yeah so those are reasonable yeah, yeah, things yeah. and everyone is an individual they uh, uh have to accept a certain level of responsibility you know and do that yeah. but uh, i i've uh, in my personal opinion and professional opinion uh you have been uh, uh, really conservative as you said i would have been probably even more open-minded and, and adventurous with using yeah. that you know so you and, and you follow all the uh, reasonable, uh, medically uh, grounded uh, precautions. You know, there's a light yeah. sensitivity test to that. There's specific limitations, indications, and all. Yeah, that is absolutely great. Another thing, uh, if I remember correctly, it's it's a wireless device, and uh, although right. the previous version was uh, on the through the Bluetooth or something like that or Wi-Fi, now you have a thing that like can completely upload it. To the unit, and then yeah. you disconnect even the yeah, yeah. The, and this also is, there's no electromagnetic negative. Yeah, uh, in the, it, uh, the, the, the the prototype uh, is half measure on some of these. Uh, yes, it's fully portable. That's one thing. You recharge it, uh, and you you use a smartphone to to do certain commands. Uh, in the prototype, we still have some Bluetooth streaming. Uh, in the uh, in the the proper design, the the commercial design, uh, there's not good. Uh, yeah, it's fully in the headset. Uh, the, the command from the smartphone is a Bluetooth command that lasts about a millisecond uh -huh. because it just commands, it just tells the headset what to do. Uh, there's no Bluetooth streaming uh, at all, zero, uh, in, the, uh, in the proper design, in the full design. So yeah, you, it's like a, you're, as long as your phone is charged, and your headset is charged, uh, you can go anywhere. You can go out into the mountaintop like up here. Mm -hmm. and and use neurovisor mm -hmm. so that's um you know that's good thank you very much brother you know it's been over yeah, two you're... hours over two hours two hours yeah. uh, plus you know i mean th this is really we can continue talking and talking about it yeah yeah, yeah. and well, there's that's just a, about that's all other things uh, endlessly, you know, endlessly. I, I, have, I have to say i told you when i called you that i had a I don't know why this is. I had a premonition earlier today. I thought, you know, this is all totally fine as long as the electricity in the village doesn't go out. Because I live in a little village, about 450 people, quite a traditional village. Mm -hmm. I'm hidden away. They, I mean, you can't even see where my house is, as you know. Uh, but uh, it's season change. And uh, every once in a while, a tree will fall down or take out the, the power. And that's why I'm, I'm uh, finishing this talk with an interruption. Uh, I'm standing on my porch outside using my iPhone because the cell towers are still working. And you can see what, the, what they think at the top. Right. <laughs> do we have 5G coming there? What's your opinion on this 5G? What do you think? I have no opinion. Stuff? I have no opinion. You never studied it or something? Yeah, I, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, do I like the idea? Uh, you know, depending on my mood. Uh, I'm not heavily against it uh, uh -huh. i'm sorry i'm not i'm yeah. not uh, heavily uh i was putting the phone to my ear um what do i think i don't know uh, i'm not smart enough to know it i don't know you know i do know that you know millimeter wave therapy is, is a powerful thing oh absolutely you know, uh, i yes. have i have millimeter wave uh, devices, waves, yeah. you know, 
Russian or Eastern European in origin, and they have very good therapeutic benefit. I think it's getting to be accepted that uh, cells communicate uh, in a millimeter wave uh, level, and 5G is spooky because it's kind of nuzzling right up there. So mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. You know, today when I was at my car, you know, I have I, it's one of these you know beeper push button things to unlock it. You know, I had it in my pocket and my back is turned and I pushed the little button and, you know, the, the car goes beep. I think, well, mm -hmm. you know, that shit went straight through my body. Yikes. But I, okay, you know, I don't know. Um, you wow. know, pick your battles, wow. right? Pick yeah. Pick your battles. Yep. Well, uh, we, this okay. is uh, this conversation is not ended yet. I mean, we, we're going to end it now, <laughs> but we're going to continue it some other day. Yeah. Uh, man, thank you very really much. Brother. Yeah, yeah, you will. We, we may have to chop it into pieces. I don't know how many people could tolerate this much chatter for this we, long. We, we, can, we can do both. We can have the whole video. We can do the clips and all. And uh, I'm going to have some very interesting uh, meetings next week. And uh, probably, I, I, I'm definitely, I'm going to talk uh, to people what I was talking to you about. And maybe we can arrange all something right. like three parties, you know, somebody, some uh, other people who are interested in brain entrainment in uh, neuroplasticity, they can join yeah. our conversations. As uh, okay. for now, thanks everyone for watching. Mr. Garner Dupuy, thank you yeah. very much for being here, okay, brother. Be safe, thanks, be Dean. well. Okay. Adios, and all the friend. rest. Adios. I'm going to go have dinner. Take care. <laughs> Enjoy your dinner. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.